Single colour borders may have their place, but it's certainly not at Dixter. Rules are for breaking, thinks Christopher Lloyd, and he lets some tall plants creep in at the front of this border, making a screen that you peer through to admire the depths of the planting beyond. Well, I like this bit of the border best of all, actually. You know? The tamarisk, you notice? Yes. Ordinary summer flowering tamarisk. It's such a good shrub. You just cut it back as hard as you want to every winter. It's such an odd plant, that, isn't it? You're never quite sure which bit is foliage and which bit is flower. Mm. And you've got that wonderful great punch there, haven't you, yeah. that crocosmia? Ah, that's my own breeding. I'm rather pleased with that. We call that Dixter Flame. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. You yeah. never say anything that's Christopher Lloyd, though, do you? It's um, a... no, I don't want plants named after me. I think that's an awful bit of vanity, I must do you? say. No. <laughs> Doesn't say anything about the plant, does it? No, no. Fantastic grape for Bascoms. I think Olympicum is a good name yes, for that, for yes. Bascom Olympicum. Certainly Olympicum. And those very, are the two biggest like. I've ever had, Are actually. they? Mm. Yes. What porridge have you been giving them, or is it just... Good no, I think, I don't know what it is they've enjoyed. That first year when they're layering all those leaves, they do tend to actually they squash do. everything they're, inside, they they don't are, they? They've but got very wide elbows. Yes, the end mm. result is worth it. I have to be careful, though, in the early summer, they get a terrible caterpillar on them, a very handsome one. Do you get that? Yes, mullein moss. Yes, the mullein moss. Yes, you, you can have to strip them, them overnight, can't you it? You have to pick them off every day. It's very good having that backdrop of that deep purple. That's the smoke bush, and it's the kind that never does smoke, and so I prune it quite hard to get the good foliage. Yes. It's royal purple. It's a bit obvious putting purple and yellow together. But they are sort of let down by the soft greyish blue of the Loch Inch bud. They're plastered with butterflies. Plastered with butterflies, I know. It's, isn't it good to see them? And then, of course, there's Jackman's clematis behind. Yes. Jackman, I. You've given it an enormous amount of height on You know, pole, when people you? say they haven't got room for a clematis, it's such nonsense, because all you have to do is to put a pole in somewhere, and you've got all that vertical space, yes. which is doing nothing. Yes. And I just tie it up as it goes up the pole each year, and it makes a column of colour. I'm very much of an impulse buyer, and uh, I don't see why one shouldn't, because one of the great joys in gardening is to be carried away by a new plant. The sight of it and the feeling that it could be yours makes a great gleam come into your soul as well as your eyes, and uh, you feel, I must have that plant. And then, of course, having got it, you think, oh, where am I going to put it? At the moment, there's a verbena looking for a home. Where should it go? Well, somewhere where there's some forget-me-nots, probably, or um, a gap has developed for some reason or another. Yes. And I want them to look right where they are. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. It's got to be something sort of reasonably far forward, though. There's not much space here. No. Love the flocks. Well, Marjorie Fish gave me that, and it is the sort of prototype of the herbaceous flocks as we all grow. It's the wild one, Phlox paniculata itself. It's much more loose, yeah. isn't it, and, mm. and elegant much. Mm. And do you see the way it's sort of mingled with the daylilies? It did that itself and it's really worked rather well. But which daylily is that? That's Marion Vaughan. Mm. That's an American, quite an old one now. And it shows up well. The, the yellow ones are much more um, effective in the garden, I think, than the, those rather brown and sort of yes. liverish coloured, uh, putrid rather meat colour ones, ones that mm. everybody's mad about nowadays. Looks as though it's quite free, free flowering, that one, too. It's sort of got do you, this nice. Do you like uh, the teasels? Yes, at the I front. love the teasels. I think they're terrific. Uh, I like the way you can sort of peer through the teasels. That's too. right. So it doesn't matter that they're tall. No. They put themselves, you'll just get rid of the seedlings you can't <laughs> yes. take. Them. Probably rather too many seedlings. Mm. Now, there's a possible space. How about that for your verbena? Is, is well, there something there else going hostas, on? There are hostas, yes, but between the hostas, there are s masses of tulip bulbs, and mm. I don't really want to dig them up. That's a strong character, isn't it? Yes, in your it magnif is. Do you see the way its uh, rays shiver in the wind? I love that. Because they're rather long. And the, bre are. the breeze gives them a sort of vibration. Yes. Gives them a life of their own. It needs a big garden, though. Oh, red roses singing out there. Well, roses are one of the things that are useful in a border to give you red, which isn't all that frequent in the herbaceous plants. Which one is that rose? That's Florence May Morse, oh. and it's a good steady shade of yes. red, and it flowers for a long time. It's yes. a very good shade. And I, I think this is going to be the place for our verbena. Do you? Why? Well, 
it's a bright purple and that's a bright red but this has very small flowers got lots of green around it so i think the contrast will be super <laughs> be a real i shall plant it there anyway <laughs> <laughs> but you can't worry about where to put a homeless verbena until the structure of the home itself is right i think that it is very important with the garden to have a good framework well Dixter's very lucky in that, that uh, those Luscians who designed it and my father did the sunk garden. And um, they were both architects, and so it is a well-structured garden. But then, if it was nothing more than that, it would look very formal and uncomfortable and unfriendly. But my mother and I were both people who principally loved plants and wanted plants to look as though they were enjoying themselves. The use of colour often seems to be a source of agony to gardeners. Was there ever a time when you worried about it? No, I, don't, I really don't think um, it was brought to my consciousness. My mother had no particular inhibitions about colour, but I do think that a lot of people, when they're starting gardening, are worried about colour. They're worried that in case they do something that would be vulgar and that would arouse comment, which would bring a blush to their cheeks. It's an awful shame, but, you know, it's... You should make your own mistakes and then uh, correct them. But they go for rather safe, hello dear. They go for rather safe combinations with uh, silvers and greys because they know that that's done at Sissinghurst and that must be good. And they uh, avoid the nice bright colours like red and yellow. They may like them, but they don't, uh, they hardly dare use them. A lot of people say, I don't like orange. And it seems to me such a shame that every colour is good in its way but um, you just want to learn how to use them. Do you think there are any rules at all? Well, I wouldn't put two bright colours together, two bright opposing colours together. That is to say, I'd love to do a pink and a yellow border, unfashionable though it is, but I wouldn't put a bright pink next to a bright yellow. I would certainly have a soft yellow with a bright pink and uh, probably let it down with some grey as well. And you, you, you see very uncomfortable colour combinations in some front garden bedding out, like bright scarlet salvia with bright yellow marigolds. That, I think, is hard and uh, unsympathetic. But otherwise, I like using all the colours, and uh, sometimes it's quite difficult to get enough red into a border rather than too little. Do you think colour, though, is the most important thing to think about when, when you're putting together Oh, no. I, I, really, I think that foliage is more important than, uh, the, plant, than the flower, because... Uh, the foliage is there for so much longer, it's got so much more structure, you can get so much the m more size and uh, fabric into a leaf than you can into the majority of flowers. And so I would say that the flowers are, this is, I mean, Beth Chatter has said this too, I'm really quoting her, the flowers are a bonus and the foliage is what you want to look at first, which doesn't mean to say I don't plant any things like phloxes, for instance, that have quite dull foliage, because I like big blocks of colour from them as well, but I, I consider that the foliage has a greater role to play. With me, the first consideration is the well-being of the plant, because I am a plantsman. And to see a happy plant is my first consideration. But after that, I am very much aware of the context that I'm putting the plant into. And of course, we learn by making mistakes. We all know that. I mean, look at the number of marriages some people have to go through. But um, with the plant, I suppose it's much the same, really. It's a, it's a kind of marriage, and some of them go wrong, and some of them work out extremely well. So you are drawing on experience, uh, the light that it will want, the shade, the, the moisture factor, and how it will look next to its neighbours. Those are the three principal things. For Christopher Lloyd, labour-saving gardening is not a priority. If you're not gardening because you want to, but because the garden is there and you feel you've got to do something about, that, about it, then the labour-saving garden, I suppose, is very important. But I find this a very tedious and boring aspect of gardening, which I'd much rather leave to the hack writers who are constantly trying to persuade lazy people that they can get good results without working for them. Of course, this isn't true at all. They talk about ground cover plants as 
uh, floor carpeting, for instance, might be a sort of wall-to-wall -wall carpets, which you can't expect to be very exciting. And those plants, if left to themselves, will become less and less exciting as the years go by, because they'll need attention. If you will give them that attention and replant them over a few years, they'll flower for you much better, they'll have much better foliage, but they cease to be labour-saving plants. If you don't want to garden, forget about the labour saving. Go and play golf, go and do anything else. But if you are gardening, the chances are your garden isn't all that large, and therefore it's rather ridiculous to talk about labour saving when you could perfectly easily spare the time to put the labour in and enjoy it. And there is great enjoyment from growing a good plant.